Okay. So, um, sorry about that delay. I wanted to make sure that I was actually going to get everything on the recording. Uh, the second session is basically going to take what Denise had just taught us and expound upon it to understand how you can use um, computational services on the internet and uh, web pages and other types of, of tools to understand how proteins uh, work and how the be what the behavior of proteins are. Right? So, so presumably you're interested in this, this um, workshop because you're going to be working with proteins at some point. And if you're studying a new protein, or even if you're studying a protein that's, that's fairly well understood, uh, it's very likely that you're going to be um, asking questions about its properties in uh, a test tube or in some kind of experimental uh, regime. Or, you know, if you're doing simulations, uh, you're going to be asking questions about the properties of that protein. Uh, and the point of this session is to show you that, hey, lots of protein properties can be calculated uh, just from the primary sequence alone. And you can actually learn quite a bit about the protein that you're interested in without ever having set foot uh, in a laboratory environment. And so that's what we're going to be uh, focusing on uh, in this session. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a chemist, I'm a biophysical chemist, but I'm a chemist nonetheless. And so even though biologists and, and biochemists maybe often think about proteins as uh, blocks or, or some kind of spheres on a, on a page or some kind of, you know, step in a pathway, uh, ultimately proteins are chemicals. And so all of the properties that chemicals have uh, also apply to proteins, uh, including things like molecular weight, um, a chemical formula, isoelectric point. So again, for, for those of you who maybe haven't thought about this in a while, an isoelectric point is the pH. Uh, at which the protein has a net neutral charge. Um, <clears throat> it has a, a sequence and residue composition like, like Danusha was telling us about. Uh, things like solubility are very important when you're thinking about proteins. Uh, structure, uh, and so we talked about structure in the last session. And then uh, concentration and extinction coefficient. Um, and in particular, if you're, uh, if you're interested in any kind of biophysical study or any kind of biochemical study, uh, say, for example, enzyme kinetics or, or protein function, uh, the concentration is an extremely important property. Uh, and I often talk with biologists um, who, who send me a protein sequence and they tell me the, the, the um, you know, they, they tell me, okay, this, this test tube contains a protein in it. Um, and I say, well, what's the concentration and how do I determine the concentration? And they might not know as well, I just know that it has the activity that I want. Well, that's great, and, and that's a starting point. But, but since proteins are chemicals, more of that chemical means more activity. And so if I'm trying to quantify how much activity something has, uh, calculate a specific activity per concentration, I'm going to need to know how much is there. And so if you don't understand how much of a something you have, it's, it seems like a very basic question, uh, but you're not going to be able to, to ask particular questions about your protein if you don't understand the concentration and, and you can measure the concentration some way. And so the, the question before us is how do we access this information? Right? Because when you're just given a protein sequence, you have no idea uh, how to calculate any of that. Uh, and it's not at all obvious that, that you know, the protein concentration, um, or if I have an extinction coefficient, so some optical way, it's not at all obvious that, that the um, extinction coefficient of an alpha helix uh, is going to be anything at all related to the extinction coefficient of, of a beta strand or a beta sheet. And so, so these are questions that are before us that, that aren't necessarily, that don't necessarily have obvious solutions. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we're going to try to pick, pick a few sort of representative um, proteins and, um, yeah, I would say during the break, if, if you don't have your laptop with you and you want to go grab it, uh, you know, you'll, you'll get much more out of these sessions uh, if you can work along uh, with us uh, or with me or whoever up at the, the lectern. Um, and, and we're going to try to keep, keep some um, sort of traditional proteins in mind so that we can take those protein sequences and put them through um, the different uh, databases that are out there. Uh, and 
uh, one of those proteins that we're going to use uh, frequently, because we use it often in my lab, um, is this very small uh, 56 residue uh, protein called GB3. Right? And so again, we, we talked about last time the primary structure. Uh, we can represent that in terms of bonds, um, but we can also represent that in terms of three-letter codes. Uh, so this you know, starts with methionine, uh, that has connected to glutamine, tyrosine, um, lysine, and it goes on and on. Um, and so that's the three-letter code. By convention, again, just to, as a reminder, we usually start with the N terminus, and then we end with the carboxy or the C terminus of the protein. Um, it's usually much more convenient to represent primary structure in terms of the one-letter codes. Right? And that's why it's, you know, Danusha talked a lot about memorization. Um, if you immerse yourself in this field, you will end up memorizing these. Um, but the quicker you can do that, the easier it will be to, uh, to, to, to be successful. And so, you know, here's the one letter sequence of GB3, and, and you can see it fits very conveniently on, a, on two lines. Um, so, once we represent our protein sequence this way, uh, the question becomes, well, well, now it's just a string, right? So strings are, are just lists of characters. And so this is this is definition of a, of a computer string, where I start with an M, I have a Q, a Y, K, L, et cetera. Um, and lots and lots of programs out there are really good at taking strings and comparing them to other strings and um, making inferences about, about strings, and right? So you might think, well, what does that mean? Well, when you type a search phrase into Google, you're typing a string of characters, you know, how many pizza shops are there in Starkville? And Google is interpreting that and coming up with some kind of answer, right? And so all of the computer science tools that have been used to understand um, how to process and interpret strings uh, can be used when you represent a protein sequence like this. Right? Certainly this is in English, so you can't use exactly the same algorithms, um, but you can you know, modify those algorithms slightly, and now you have a whole language where you can you know, treat proteins as, as sentences, if you will, and understand their properties based on the same kinds of ideas. Um, in addition, it's, it's, better, it's better than that even, because you know, the word the, I mean, it doesn't have any physical properties, right? It has semantic meaning. Um, but if I think about uh, tyrosine, Y, uh, you know, that has physical properties. It has hydrophobicity. It has a hydrogen bonding group on the end of it, right? So in addition, I can augment all of those algorithms that are going into a standard Google search, and I can combine them with things like physical chemistry and physical properties, and I can say, well, you know, E, um, glutamic acid is going to be chemically similar to the letter D, aspartic acid, because those, they're both acidic groups. They have a negative charge at neutral pH. Right? So, so the one dimensional or the one letter sequence of, of, an, of a protein uh, is extremely powerful. And um, in the past you know, 20, 30 years, uh, lots and lots of people have, have taken advantage of this um, you know, combination of computational search power and chemical informatics and combine them to come up with lots and lots of unique abilities to, to understand how proteins behave. Okay, and so we're going to jump right in here um, and we're going to go to uh, ProParam and we're going to uh, essentially look at how this, this, this web page, ProParam, um, behaves with our GB3 sequence. And so this is why it's nice if you have a laptop to have it with you, because you can work along and, and follow along as, as you want. Um, and so if you, and, and if you've downloaded the um, lecture slides, which I also recommend doing, um, at least now or before lecture, you can basically just copy and paste the sequence out of the PDF. Uh, and then we're going to go to ProParo. And so you can either type it on this, or you can, you can right-click it and hit open hyperlink. Uh, 
Uh, it's a very simple web page, right? It's, o it's only one box, right? So, so Proparam is a tool that's designed for understanding how to, or, or some of these chemical properties of a protein based on its primary structure or its, or its sequence. All right, so all it's basically asking you for is the one letter code of your amino acid sequence, which we can just paste in uh, because we copied it from the uh, slides. Right? So there's my 56 amino acids. They're grouped in groups of 10. So this would be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and then six amino acids here. Uh, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to hit submit or compute parameters. <clears throat> and in a second or two, uh, it brings up the result, right? And so what it's done is it's gone through and it's analyzed that sequence and it's computed a lot of sort of basic fundamental information uh, that you might want to know. We're going to spend a good bit of time going through this and figuring out what these, uh, you know, what, what each section of this means, right? And so you can imagine that one of the simplest things you might want to count, and, and in this case it's, it's extremely simple because the protein is so small, but if you have a 3,000 residue amino acid sequence, you might not want to count up to 3,000, uh, or even the 3,000 by tens. Uh, and so the first thing it does is it calculates uh, the number of amino acids. Right? And, and as promised, this protein does have 56 amino acids, so I wasn't lying. Uh, but it can do the next step, too, because each one of those single characters, D, E, F, uh, G, S, T, etc., you know, they represent chemical structures. And each one of those chemical structures has a certain molecular mass. And when you start forming peptide bonds between residues, you start adding those masses up to get a, a, a sum or a net molecular weight of, of your protein, right? And so uh, if I sum up all of those amino acids in this case, I end up with a molecular weight of uh, 6200 or 6207.87. Um, now you might say, well, okay, that's cool, but remember all of our calculations of molarity are, are basically, you know, moles per liter. But, you know, when I look at a protein powder, uh, or a powder of a protein, I don't necessarily know well, that represents, you know, five micromole. Uh, I'm, I'm going to measure the mass, right? And so this, this number, uh, molecular weight in terms of grams per mole or, or Daltons, gives us the ability to take a mass of a protein and to determine uh, a concentration based on that mass, because then I can take that protein mass and I know exactly how many moles I have uh, in that uh, protein sample that I can weigh. Right, so that's that's extremely useful information. Uh, there's also lots of uh, lots of experimental techniques that can be used to determine the protein size, and we'll talk about those a little bit during this session too. Um, so, so these two are, are basic but extremely useful. Uh, the theoretical isoelectric point or the theoretical PI, uh, it basically assumes that all of the um, ionizable amino acids, so the carboxylic groups. Uh, the histidine, uh, indole ring, uh, the, the basic groups, lysine and arginine, um, you know, it basically assumes all of those titrate independently and it says, well, if they're all behaving independently, what do I expect uh, the isoelectric point or the, the, the pH at which this protein has no net charge to be? Uh, and in this case, you can see that this, this protein is acidic. Uh, in that the, the isoelectric point is, is less than 7. Uh, and so it would predict that at four, pH 4.8, uh, this protein would have uh, neutral net charge. Uh, and above that pH, then you would have negative net charge. And so um, that's not necessarily true, right? So, so electrostatics is an extremely complicated process. And so this is an estimate of the isoelectric point, but you might actually measure it and find that it's, it's slightly different from 4.8. Uh, but this gives you a starting point uh, to go on if you're um, doing some kind of protein purification where you're using charge to separate one set of proteins from another. Now we're not going to talk about you know, advanced methods on protein purification during this session, but this is a way to sort of get that information if you find that you need it later on. Uh, amino acid composition is pretty, pretty self-explanatory. It's, it's just the number of different amino acids of each type uh, divided by the total number of amino acids. Uh, not a lot of you know, terribly useful things here. 
Um, although, as an NMR spectroscopist, uh, oftentimes I'm asking the people in my group, okay, well, how many glycines do you have? Uh, because glycines have a very distinct NMR signal. Um, tryptophans have another very distinct NMR signal. Uh, and so looking through uh, the amino acid composition, I can see, well, I do have a few glycines. Um, I do have one tryptophan. Uh, tryptophan is going to be important later on um, when we talk about extinction coefficient. Um, but you can see that there's all sorts of other types of amino acids that you can look at. And so you can sort of get a feel for, is this going to be a highly charged protein? Is this going to be a neutral protein? Uh, if you have lots of Ds, Es, Ks, and, and Rs, um, so again, uh, acidic residues, basic residues, there's going to be a lot of char charge going around. Uh, if you have hardly any, well then that tells you that, that your protein is going to be mostly neutral. Uh, so that's useful. Um, you can write, or it, it calculates the atomic or the molecular formula, right? So this is, this is um, you know, probably less useful for many of you. Uh, because, you know, you don't necessarily want to represent a protein as C274H427N69093S1, right? That, that's not, you know, you know, C6H1206 is great for sugars, but, um, but you're not going to talk about a protein being this way. Lots of, one reason is that there's lots of isomers, right? So you, if you mix the amino acids, it's going to have the same, you know, if you shuffle them, it's going to have the same molecular formula. But, uh, this can be useful if you're thinking about something like um, atomic analysis. So how many sulfurs are in my protein? Well, now you can get a nice convenient measure that there's only one uh, for GB3. Uh, when I do isotopic labeling, so I, I substitute all of my carbon-12 uh, nuclei out for C13, and I want to ask myself, how does that affect the molecular weight? Well, it basically means I add one to the molecular weight for every carbon in my molecular formula. So I can get that here. I can say, okay, I just take C, you know, my molecular weight of 6,200, and I add another 274 to it, and that's going to be the molecular weight of the C13 labeled protein. So this is a very useful tool uh, if you're thinking about, you know, how does, what's the, what's the ratio of, of uh, elements in my protein that I'm looking at? Uh, for you simulation folks, uh, since Robert came in, you know, if you're thinking about molecular simulation, you know, you want to, and you have constraints on how many atoms you can simulate simultaneously, you know, this will tell you how many atoms you would expect to have in a, in a protein that's, that's this structure. Um, extinction coefficients, we're going to get into that later on, but, but if you remember Beer's Law, uh, Beer's Law is the way that you relate uh, absorbance in a UV-Vis spectrophotometer to the concentration of a molecule, and the, the ra ratio of those two numbers is the extinction coefficient. So knowing the extinction coefficient uh, is an important thing. Uh, it turns out that this is the extinction coefficient at 280 nanometers, so that's the wavelength of light that we're going to be measuring. Um, and you know that turns out to be very dependent on the number of tryptophans and tyrosines in the proteins. And so if you don't have tryptophans and tyrosines, it's going to tell you, it's going to give you a little warning here that we don't think your extinction coefficient is too accurate. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that too in a second. Uh, but this is just sort of the overview. Um, and then finally, it gives you an estimated half-life. So this is not like a half-life in terms of radioactive decay, but this is an estimated half-life in the cell, right? So how long do we think that this protein is going to be around before the cell's natural machinery comes in and chews it up and recycles it to make more protein. Um, and so I rarely use this number, so I don't have any idea how accurate these numbers are. Um, but if you're thinking about, you know, um, looking at this protein in vivo, this is a human protein, and you want to say, well, is this protein going to be around for a while or is it going to be very short-lived? Uh, you, can, you can get an estimation from that uh, just from the amino acid sequence. Okay, and then so it gives a little bit of, uh, you know, whether it's a hydrophobic or a hydrophilic protein, we're not going to get into that because that's a little bit more advanced than what we want to talk about. But a lot of the information here is pretty basic, but it's extremely useful. Uh, and, and like I uh, showed you coming in, 
you know, you can, you can walk through this and simply, you know, look at the sequence. And if you want to edit the sequence, so, so for example, if I take out that tryptophan and hit compute parameters again, I told you it would give me a warning about the extinction coefficient. And right there it is. This protein does not contain any trip residues. Experience shows this could resolve more than 10% error in the in computed extinction coefficient. So, uh, so again, the sequence matters when you're thinking about things like measuring the concentration. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit, but, but why do these numbers matter? What, what good are they? All right, so I told you that molecular weight is important because we have, um, there we go. Um, molecular weight is important because it's an experimental measurable, right? If I'm purifying a protein from some kind of solution, uh, I can count or I can do some experiments and determine um, in a given mixture what molecular weights are represented. Right? So, so what I've drawn here is a polyphilamide gel uh, where we have multiple lanes. And again, from your biochemistry class, you'll, you'll learn a little bit more about how this works. Uh, but essentially what happens is we load our samples up here in the top. And in a special solution, uh, all of those proteins are going to have uh, a negative charge, so a net negative charge based on the detergent that we're using. And it, that negative charge sort of normalizes out the protein charge per unit length. And as those negatively charged proteins flow down through the gel, right, so we have a positively charged electrode down here that attracts those proteins. So they're drawn through the gel. The small proteins go fast because they can flow through the gel pretty easily. The large proteins are tied up, and so they don't trans or, uh, they're not transported very efficiently. And so they're stuck here up at the top. And what you see is if you have a mixture, you'll see different bands corresponding to the different molecular weights uh, in your uh, protein sequence. And so that's, that's useful because now, if I run some molecular weight standards here on the, on the uh, leftmost lane, right? so this lane basically contains all of our standards. Um, and I know the molecular weights of all of these proteins. Well, now I can estimate or calculate the molecular weights of the unknown proteins, right? So that gives me a way to measure the molecular weight of a protein in a mixture. Or if it's a pure protein, right, because I can see if there's multiple proteins showing up here, I can tell whether I'm pure or not. Uh, but if it's a pure protein, like, for example, this protein, uh, and, you know, suppose this is a 20 kilodalton marker, well, now I know this protein is fairly pure because it appears to be the dominant band in this lane, uh, but it, it, it weighs about or has a molecular mass of about 20 kilodaltons. So, so very, very useful information that I can then go back and compare to the Proparam experiment or the Proparam webpage. Um, now, again, that, that, as far as significant figures, that's a pretty, you know, it's a rough estimate of the protein size. I'm not going to be able to differentiate, you know, 20 kilodaltons from, you know, 20 kilodaltons plus one, um, right? So, so electrophoresis isn't going to get you that. Um, you know, no method using some kind of uh, uh, separation like this is going to be able to get you that kind of information. You can probably distinguish maybe between, you know, 20 kilodaltons and 21 kilodaltons. Uh, but even there, if it's in a mixture, you might not get the resolution of the two separate bands. Uh, if you want that kind of high resolution mass measurement, the, the method that you want to use is mass spectrometry. Right? And so um, we do this routinely in the lab. Uh, and for any new protein that we express, we, we say, OK, we've got to measure the mass spectrum of it. Uh, and again, way too much information here to go into the details of how mass spec works. but. I'll tell you, if I do a mass spectrometry measurement of GB3, and we determined that, what, the molecular weight was, let's add our tryptophan back in here. It was like something like 6207, I thought. Yeah, 6207.8. If I do a mass spec on that protein on our, our low res instrument, I can routinely get within two, two dollars. 
So I'll measure like 6205. And if I do it on the high res system, I can get within a tenth of a Dalton, so 6207.7 or something like that. So the mass spectrometry is, is really the way to go if you really want to understand, you know, is this protein exactly the mass that I expect it to be? Uh, that can be really important if you're thinking about, you know, was this protein post-translationally modified, right? So has it been phosphorylated? You know, that's going to make a big difference in the mass. Uh, and I'll be able to detect that on a mass spec system. I'm not going to be able to detect it on SDS page, uh, at least not unless I do isoelectric fo focusing or something else like that. Uh, residue composition, again, we saw we could measure this on protparam. Um, important for a couple of different reasons. So, so I told you that you know NMR, uh, it could be very useful. So this is an HSQC, or a two-dimensional NMR spectrum of GB3. Uh, so all 56 residues are represented here. Uh, and as promised, all of those glycines, so I, I think we said there were five glycines, or no, four glycines in this protein, all four of them appear up here in the uh, sort of central north uh, region of the HSQC. There's a couple of threonines as well, um, but all of those glycines are up there. So again, if you, if you have a protein that has 15 glycines and you record an HSQC spectrum of it and you only see three peaks up there, it probably tells you that there's something going on with your protein. It's not going to give you a good NR spectrum. Uh, similarly, over here, you know, we have the phenylalanine residue but this other, other red peak that shows up over here is from the uh, tryptophan um, indole ring, right? So that's going to be our N epsilon. Um, and, and so if I have tryptophans in there, the side chains of the tryptophans are going to appear over in that region of the, uh, the HSQC. Uh, so, so sequence comp or residue composition can be important from that point of view. Uh, another uh, an important consideration is whether there are cysteine residues, right? So cysteine residues have uh, sulfur groups in them, uh, and they can form, um, under oxidizing conditions, di uh, disulfide bonds or cystine uh, pairs, right? And that can be, I mean, lots of proteins, that's their native structure. Their native structure has disulfides in it, and that's part of the natural tertiary structure of the protein. On the other hand, if those SH groups are sticking out in the solution, over time they can oxidize and your pure protein, your, your, all the protein that you worked hard to purify, they're going to form disulfide linked dimers, which are going to basically contaminate your system with, with non-native um, or, or non-natural uh, types of dimerization that don't form in the cell. Uh, and so. Uh, if you don't have any cysteines in your protein, it's great because you don't have to worry about this at all. Uh, if you do have cysteines, you're either doing one of two things. You're, you're, you're going very careful uh, to make sure that um, you're always under anaerobic conditions, which is probably not what most people in this room will ever do. Uh, but basically, you, you dissolve some kind of gas like argon in your solution, and then you care, keep it under... Um, you know, either vacuum or, or argon atmosphere to prevent oxygen from, from re-dissolving uh, in your solution. Uh, because this reaction is, you know, even though oxygen doesn't appear in that reaction, it's catalyzed by, by O2 in solution. Um, but really, realistically, what most people do is they'll add what are called reducing agents. And so these are just chemical compounds that have a stronger uh, redox potential that, that tend to drive that reaction back to the left so that if you have disulfides that form in solution, it sort of reverses that and then drives the, the dimers uh, back into monomers. Uh, BME is the cheapest. Uh, it's also the smelliest. Um, now I take that back. DTT smells pretty bad too. Um, DTT is a little bit preferable because of its um, chemical properties. Uh, BME actually, when it, when it reduces a, a, a disulfide, it actually leaves a, a chemical residual on, on the protein. So uh, when you go from this back to the SH, you'll have actually the, the remnants of a, a BME molecule on there, uh, which isn't desirable. So DTT solves that problem. Uh, and so it's a stronger reducing agent. Uh, TCEP um, doesn't smell at all. 
It's, uh, it's actually a great reducing agent, but it's, of the three, it's the most expensive. Um, and so there's some traditional sort of uh, concentrations that you might use. Um, again, I'm not here to tell you how to do your protein preps. These are just sort of ideas uh, that you can you know, see, oh, that's why, that's why I'm adding BME, or that's why I'm adding DTT to this, this mixture. Um, so residue composition. Um, extinction coefficient, again, this is really important. Um, and let's see, yeah, so I do have Beer's Laws on here. So again, if I have a protein, uh, so this is another protein that I've worked on called staphylococcal nuclease. Um, it's involved in chewing up DNA, as you might imagine, nuclease. Uh, our tryptophan side chain uh, tends to absorb light at 280 nanometers. So more tryptophans, either more tryptophans in the sequence or more tryptophans in the sense that you have you know, higher protein concentration, you're going to absorb more light at 280 nanometers. And so this is a UV vis uh, spectrophotometer. We have one of these in my lab. It's great. Um, although it's older at this point, but it still works beautifully. Uh, you basically put your protein in a little cuvette. Uh, it shines light from, from one box to the other box. And then it gives you this spectrum of how much light is absorbed as a function of wavelength. Right? And so you can see here, here's for uh, two, two proteins, a, a low concentration and a higher concentration. And you can see the low concentration has a, a peak of one height at 280 nanometers, then the higher concentration has a peak at another height. And, and more absorbance at a wavelength means more protein for the same protein. Um, now there's some caveats here, and we're going to um, go through some of those. Always keep in mind that our extinction coefficient is an estimate. Um, you know, even the best calculations are often, you know, can be, you know, within 10% error, which is pretty good. But if you're trying to, you know, if you're trying to report uh, a number that's, you know, accurate to 300 decimal places, which you could do with any scientific experiment, um, you're not going to be able to do it this way, right? So uh, keep in mind that your extinction coefficient it might give you the best estimate around, but it's not you know, precise to, you know, five decimal places or more. 10% is usually a good estimate. Maybe you can get better. Uh, but the real way to measure this is, you know, actually make sure you have a nice um, pure sample and then take the mass and do the, uh, do the uh, concentration determination that way. Did you have a question? That was going to be my question. Is it a pure sample or can it be an heterogeneous mixture of protein? Well, if you're only looking at the UV vis, and if multiple proteins in your mixture have tryptophans in them, they're all going to absorb. And so you're going to get, um, you're going to get a, a, an artificially higher concentration from this if, you, if your sample is not pure. All right, so uh, this will tell you the concentration of tryptophans. And then we use the sequence information and assume that the protein is pure to say what's the concentration of the protein. Um, so, so yeah, caveat mTOR, if you don't have a pure protein, you're not going to be able to get an accurate concentration from this. Similarly, if you have another huge chromophore, like we occasionally work with dyes, or if you work with uh, hemoglobin, you have the big, um, you know, heme signal in there. Uh, you know, if there's other things contributing to absorbance at this peak, well, then, then that's not going to give you an accurate concentration either. Right, so this is a picture, you know, this black curve is actually pretty good. It's a picture of a fairly pure protein. You can see there's nothing else contributing to the concentration or the peak at 280. Um, it's a little bit high. I probably wouldn't trust it being up at 1.5. But the shape looks good. And if we know that that's a pure sample, either from SDS page or some other method, um, then we can say, okay, this is probably a good way to at least estimate our protein concentration. So some practical things, um, we're often using uh, cuvettes, so this is just a picture of a cuvette. Um, many cuvettes that you might have used in your undergraduate chemistry lab are big glass things that hold about three milliliters of solution. Um, that's great, but oftentimes for biochemists, three milliliters is, is a lot, right? So, so um, we often work with smaller cuvette volumes. Right. So this is a picture, it's similar to a cuvette I have in my lab, although mine's a little bit smaller. Uh, but what you see is it basically masks 
the light path so that only light going through this little window gets through. And because of that, you can hold a much smaller volume uh, in the cubette. This one, I imagine, would probably be about 40 micro microliters. Uh, I have one in my lab that has a, a two millimeter path length that, that can measure me concentrations of 10 microliters, um, which is pretty nice. But uh, either way, you know, if there's bubbles in there or if there's some other blockage to that light path, well, then you're going to have some problems. Um, so, but generally speaking, you, you load your protein into this, this cuvette. Most cuvettes will have the path length on them. Uh, that's an important thing because the longer the path length means more absorbance uh, because there's more molecules in the path length to absorb light. Uh, many cuvettes are one centimeter in path length, and so that makes it easy. Uh, but, uh, but you would basically put your, put your protein in there, stick it in the UV vis, tell it to measure uh, the spectrum, and then you, know, you would record the absorbance at 280 nanometers, so that's your A. And then proparam gives us the extinction coefficient at 280 nanometers. And so again, if we go back to proparam, if you still have that window open, the, uh, the units or the number is 9970 per molar per centimeter. So that gives us E, the little epsilon, um, CL, so C is the concentration, and L is the path length. And if I'm thinking about, you know, how do I calculate concentration? Well, C, obviously, is equal to A over E times L. So I just take the absorbance at 280, divided by the extinction coefficient, divided by the path length, and that gives me my concentration. Uh, in this case, in molar units, because that's the units of our extinction coefficient. Right, so proparam is, is pretty much the, the easiest way to get that number. Now, if you have a number that people are using in your lab uh, that's been determined, determined experimentally or has, has been used for historical reasons, you should use that, right? Don't, don't rock the boat. Um, but it's, it's fair enough to ask, hey, why aren't we using this? Or to test it and see if you get the same answer. And so if you, somebody gives you an extinction coefficient in the lab, and you, uh, you calculate and get the same thing from Proparam, well then that's probably where they got their extinction coefficient. Uh, this is a very popular website, and so lots and lots of people uh, use it. So, as I said, what happens when, you know, tryptophan is the primary thing that's giving us that absorbance. And it's really useful because, you know, people have shown this. If my protein is in uh, a folded or compact globular conformation, the tryptophan extinction coefficient is approximately the same as if that protein were unfolded and the tryptophan is exposed to, to solvent, right? So it's not conformation dependent. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why tryptophan is so useful, uh, because you don't really care what the protein conformation is. Um, but if you don't have a tryptophan, what, what do you do then? And there are lots of proteins out there. Uh, one of the ones that we study is calmodulin. A uh, very popular calcium signaling protein doesn't have a tryptophan, the human, human uh, uh, protein. And so you can't use the proparam, or you can, but it's going to give you a number that's probably not so accurate. So there are better ways to do this if you don't have a tryptophan. Tryptophan is the easiest, uh, it's also the most precise, um, but if you don't have a tryptophan, you can actually use the intrinsic backbone of the protein itself or intrinsic absorbance of the protein backbone itself, right? And so uh, that peptide bond that Danusha talked about, it has aromatic you know, character to it. Uh, it will absorb light at 205 nanometers. And again, more absorbance means more protein. Uh, and so you can use that. Uh, there's a website here. We're not gonna, we're not gonna go into it right now. But if you're, if you're in a situation where you don't have tryptophan, that website you can go and it'll calculate the extinction coefficient uh, at 205 nanometers. Uh, this was done by uh, uh, a friend of mine, Nick Anthes. Uh, so we were both uh, postdocs at NIH together. Um, and he now does all sorts of science policy stuff. Uh, but his website is still up and it's, it's still very useful. Um, it does make things a little bit more complicated. Lots of buffers, so if you're using uh, heaps buffer or any of the goods buffers or tris, 
Uh, lots of buffers also absorb at 205 nanometers. Uh, and so, you know, you want to try to have your protein in as low of a concentration of buffers as possible. Uh, not that you can't have any buffer in there, but remember if, if, you know, if all of the absorbance is, if all of the light's being absorbed by your buffer, and then a little tiny bit more gets absorbed by your protein, you're not really learning enough, enough because you, know, you can't really detect that tiny marginal absorption uh, of your protein over the, pro of the, buff over the buffer itself. Um, other thing is that your protein concentration will need to be low for this, right? Because tryptophans, you know, you have three, four tryptophans in your protein sequence, that's great. It gives you a reasonable absorbance, but every single residue in your protein has a backbone, right? And so that means, you know, a very small amount of protein can absorb a whole lot of light. And, and um, what... Well, what we didn't really talk about is that, and we might have it on the next slide, yeah, um, is that uh, if you absorb too much light, your UV vis isn't going to be able to give you an accurate measurement, right? So you've often got to use a lower concentration of protein for this type of method than you would if you were just using tryptophan itself. Okay, so our caveats, uh, again, uh, whenever you're using numbers from ProParam, I know this is a little bit beyond tools, you know, computational tools, but um, you know, something to keep in mind because it's very, very practical. Uh, your uncertainty can be as much as 10%, uh, so, so your, your extinction coefficient is probably not accurate to seven decimal places, um, and it's only as good as your technique. So if your pipetting technique is bad, or your measurement technique is bad, uh, or there's air bubbles in your cuvette, um, it's gonna be worse. Right, so so good good reason for um, getting good technique early on. Um, a general rule for for most UV vis spectrophotometers is that the the most accurate reading of UV or absorbance is between 0.1 and 1 absorbance units. And so if I have a, an absorbance of three, uh, that's telling me that so little light is getting to the detector that you know it's basically one proton in 10 to the third, or one photon in 10 to the third photons are getting through into the detector. Uh, and so uh, remember that absorbance is a logarithmic scale. Uh, and so uh, an absorbance of 0.01 means that most of the photons, um, you know, in 10 to the minus two um, are getting through. And uh, absorbance of three means most of the protons are being absorbed. So it's a Every factor of 10, so if I go from 0.1 to 1, that means 10 times more photons are being absorbed by my sample. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind, and then I go from 1 to 2, that's another 10 times. If I go to 2 to, uh, two to 3, that's another 10 factor of 10. So it's, it's, um, it's a logarithmic scale. Uh, and so if you're finding that your absorbance is consistently high, 2 and a half, 3, et cetera, et cetera, do a dilution. Dilute it by a factor of four. And that will knock down your absorbance by a factor of four. And it will put that in your range of you know, 0.1 to 1, which is where you want to be. Um, if your baseline is not zero at 600 nanometers, that probably means that something in your system and your sample is scattering light. Unless you have a color, right? If your sample is some kind of pink color or something like that, well then, yeah, you're going to have a, a chromophore that, absor that absorbs light around 600, well, a little bit less than 600 nanometers. But um, if you have a, a, a baseline that looks like it's, it's just an exponential decay around 600 nanometers, that's the characteristic sign of um, scattering. And that means that something in your light has, um, you know, is big and is scattering light, and you probably can't use your absorbance uh, as, a, as an accurate quantitative value. Um, we can talk about that too, but again, this is getting a little bit, little bit into, the, into the weeds. Um, if you have impurities, so DNA um, or other proteins, that's going to artificially increase your absorbance at 280. It's going to give you a, a, a higher value for the concentration than what you might other ha otherwise have. And so if you're using this for protein concentration measurement, you really want to make sure your protein is pure, that there's no, no other amounts of DNA in it that, 
there's no insoluble material that's scattering light, and um, that you have no other chromophores that are absorbing light in the range of 280 nanometers. Uh, and that's going to give you the most accurate value of the, the concentration. Okay, so questions before we do one of these things and discuss things. Okay, so well, what, what, uh, what you guys can discuss with one another, and hopefully you get to know people now, uh, they're next to you, uh, is uh, why is it nice or why is it convenient that we can calculate the extinction coefficient from protein structure alone? And so I'll give you guys two minutes to discuss this and then we'll take some answers. Okay, now that my phone's started, I can see that it's been two minutes. So, uh, so who wants to uh, who wants to give this a shot? Anusha was great about knowing people. Well, I guess I guess you can read some names from here. That's great. So, uh, but uh, she was great about knowing people's names. So, I will call on you. Okay, Robert. <laughs> what do you what what do you think? Can we calculate it from primary structure alone? Why is it important? That means that just given the structure, you can guess what your figure out what your extinction coefficient is gonna be, which means you don't necessarily need to do multiple runs to build a titration curve, you can just take one sample and know what the concentration of the protein is. Multiple runs of, of what? I think you're thinking oh, simulation-wise. Which is fine, you're a computational person. Do you mean multiple experimental well, I, Yeah, I mean yeah, multiple, uh, multiple experiments. So you, okay. Like if you're trying to determine a concentration, you don't have to do multiple runs to get a titrate or multiple experiments to get a titration curve to correlate what the uh, concentration of your protein is in a sample. You so like a, a calibration curve. Like, yeah, that's yeah. A calibration yeah. Curve. So that's true. So I don't have to do a dilution series generally um, because I don't, you know, if I know the extinction coefficient, that's that's extremely useful. So I can just okay, well, that's extinction coefficient. That's my absorbance, that's the concentration. Savannah, you might have a good good answer for this. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sometimes the tertiary and the quaternary structure of the protein can um, sometimes throw off what you're trying to measure. It, yeah, exactly, so that's... So that's globular protein. That's really what I was going for, right? So if I have two proteins with the same sequence but very different structures, this property uh, means that you know, I can still measure the concentration of a protein without knowing what the structure, or without caring really even what it is, right? And I asked Savannah why that might be important, because that's not what happens with DNA, right? So DNA, you have this property called hypochromicity, where the absorbance is actually different if it's in a nice double-stranded helix, as opposed to if it's sitting out in a single strand and not, not folded, right? So in DNA, when they measure concentrations, I mean, it's a small effect, so they might not care. Uh, but some people will do, um, they'll do either heat it up, so that they heat it up and get rid of the hyperchromicity, or um, they'll, they'll do some kind of urea melt, or they'll put it in some kind of solvent where they know that there's not going to be double helix formation, so they can measure it uh, and get the, uh, the uh, concentration that way. So, so this, but this means I don't care. I can measure my protein in urea, I can measure at a high temperature where I know that it doesn't have the native or the natural fold, but I can still measure the concentration and get something meaningful. Again, within 10%. You don't want to over, be overconfident on that. Okay, so for the other two databases, or maybe, maybe even three, we're going to move a little bit more quickly because that first one covers a lot of sort of the basic physical properties. Now that we sort of have this, maybe, maybe not intuitive, but a better appreciation for proteins as chemicals, I think we can move move on a little bit and uh, think about them in terms of uh, some of the more common um, bioinformatics types of approaches. So the next database that we're going to look at is this uh, NCBI. Uh, you know, it used to be called Entree. Uh, now it's called GQuery or, or just database search. Uh, again, I'm going to go through that and search this.
right? So this is my search all NCBI databases. Uh, and you can see NCBI, um, National Center for, for Biotechnology Information or something. We can, we can look it up. I, I never remember what it is. Bio, bio, yeah, look at that. National Center for Biotechnology Information. Cool. Um, so uh, they maintain, uh, a, you know, about, you know, this is like 30 or 40 curated databases that contain lots of protein. So, so again, imagine your advisor comes in and says, hey, I'm, we're studying this protein uh, this summer. And I want you to, to learn a little bit about it. I mean, how do you start? Well, you can go to Google. And Google is often a great place to start for this kind of stuff. Uh, you can go to Google, Wikipedia. Um, you know, don't, don't forget the obvious answers. Um, but at some point, you're going to want a little bit more detail than that. Right? And so this is sort of like your Google for protein and DNA and gene uh, sequences. Uh, and so I can go in here. Um, and GB3 is probably not a good example to do, but I can go into this, this search box and let, let's just try GB3. What the heck? And I hit enter. Yeah, it's, it's searching. Um, and it's taking a while. I'm not a patient man, but, uh, but let's, let's see what it comes up with. I think for most of the rest of this, yeah, there we go. Um, so so um, for most of the rest of this, we'll be using a different protein example. But you can see just searching GB3 in there, uh, it gives me a whole bunch of results in different types of literature. Uh, and so knowing what some of these is is useful. Uh, so for example, uh, the bookshelf. So NCBI actually keeps um, copies of some old textbooks online. Uh, and so one of the, one of the classics um, in this is called uh, Albert's Molecular Biology of the Cell. I don't think you get the newest edition here, uh, but, but there is a, if you go into NCBI books and search for Albert's, you'll come up with that book and you can search within that book, um, which is sort of the classic graduate text in, in molecular cell biology. Um, but you can see there's all sorts of, uh, you know, links here, uh, now not a whole lot for GB3, but you can see where GB3 has been referenced in the, the bookshelf or the books that NCBI keeps. Um, there's uh, PubMed, which is the, the popular literature search uh, that all biochemists end up using for, for looking for literature articles. Um, PubMed Central is the, uh, you know, there's more hits here, but PubMed Central keeps the full text. So this just, PubMed just keeps the abstracts. But if, if GB3 is or mentioned in any uh, paper uh, in the full text, it shows up here in the PubMed Central. So I can click on that link and you can see um, you know, all these uh, links. Now this might, you know, GB3 is a fairly short string. So this might not be the GB3 that I'm talking about, but you can see that it's in here that you can then go look. Um, you know, Information on clinical significance. Uh, the ones that we're going to be looking at here are over here in gene, uh, protein, and um, and maybe genomes, right? So, but GB3, like I said, is not necessarily the best um, the best uh, protein to search in here because it has such a small name. And so, but you can see that this database has lots and lots of information. Maybe not so much physical chemistry information, but information on what the protein does, how it interacts with other systems, who's studied it, and what they found. Uh, and so this is a great place to go if you're trying to get some general information uh, about your protein. And so let's let's stick let's switch to a, another different types of protein. So let's uh, go here to uh, intestinal fatty acid binding protein. Okay, so I searched for that and now again the numbers of searches or the number of hit results are very different. Uh, you can see here, let's go into protein since that's clearly a protein. Uh, we can look at those results here. 
And when I look here, I see all sorts of 132N amino acid proteins uh, from different organisms. Now, I'm not a molecular biologist, so I don't know all of these organisms, but I know enough to know that they are different organisms. Uh, and I know enough that, like, radis, that's a rat. So, um, gallus gallus, that's a chicken. So, so you know, I, I, I get by. Um, but, uh, you know, Iquus, a horse. Uh, so, um, so we're not going to go here all together, but you can see that there's all sorts of results um, for intestinal fatty acid binding protein from different organisms. And when, you know, you might have seen these beautiful trees that people do uh, relating to different um, organisms in a tree of life. Uh, they're basically using this data from different organisms to generate those types of trees. Uh, and if I click on one of these, let's click on one that I actually know. Um, so horse, I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll see how we can search for human if we really want. Um, but that brings up this reference uh, or this, this uh, information page. You can see that there's uh, information on when it was published. So there's, there's information about recent publications. So characterization of equine and fatty acid binding protein and its use, use, utility in managing clinical cases of colic. Interesting. Um, so you can see there's some recent papers that have been published on this, this thing. But most often what you want is this little gold nugget here at the end, which is the protein sequence. And so there's the protein sequence that you can then take and put that into ProParam and, and get all the information out. And so if your advisor says, hey, tell me a little bit about intestinal fatty acid binding protein in a horse, you can find the sequence, you can get the molecular weight, you can get the extinction coefficient, you can start to understand how it might behave in the lab. Uh, more than that, though, you can then go back to the, the previous uh, section, and let's suppose I go here and click on gene, Now I can get all sorts of information about the DNA sequence. So where does it appear in the chromosome? What chromosome does it appear on? Um, you know, how big is it? Are there introns, exons? Uh, you know, all those types of things that you learn about in your, in your molecular biology and biochemistry classes, people have studied that. And, and you know, if it's a totally new protein that nobody's studied before, maybe you're not going to have all that information available. But for something like this, where it's been characterized previously, you're going to be able to go in here, and in particular, let's, let's go into the human one, so you can see uh, Homo sapiens, it appears on chromosome 4. I can click on that. <clears throat> Maybe. There we go. And so now I can get all sorts of information. Um, yeah, it's still loading it. Uh, so, you know, information on expression, uh, I can go and get information on the sequence. Again, more papers. Let's find the uh, sequence here because it's, yeah, NP. Well, there's the, that's the protein sequence, I believe. NC is the chromosomal sequence. So, yeah, annotation 109, that should bring us up to the, um, to the DNA. Eventually, we have to click on it a bit. This is actually going into the human genome. That's why it's taking so long, because it's loading up a lot of information. Yeah, let's, let's, uh, well, I hate to hang us up here, because we don't have that much time. But the point is that I can go in here and actually get information on uh, the DNA sequence that then encodes for the um, Maybe this is maybe this isn't the most efficient way to do that because it's loading up a lot of stuff. So probably if I just 
just search for NC and that number. For some reason, it's not letting me click. But let's just search for that. So that NC number is an accession number. I can then search. If I, yes, yeah, so that's it's because it's so big. This is the base of the chromosome. Um, if I really want to download the, the sequence, there we go. Um, eventually, we're going to get, yeah, there, so there's all the GTACs and stuff. So I can actually get the sequence of this thing. Um, it's probably easiest to go back and look at the, uh, the protein, and you can, get, you can get just the sequence for that. And so, so let's show you how to do some of this, right? So we've been looking at intestinal fatty acid binding protein. Uh, we've been bringing up all the, all the organisms that are stored. And there are a lot of organisms. If I want to start modifying that, I can type in here a big capital AND, and it needs to be capital. Uh, and so this is one of the few places where case matters here. And if I put human and then or, organ, O-R-G-N, that tells me to select my search to human organisms. Uh, so I can also put Homo sapiens in there, but it, it knows the basics. You know, if I put rat, it's going to bring up the, the name for rat. Um, and now I can go in here and you see the search results are much lower. And if I search protein again, it's going to bring up only uh, human proteins. All right, so and these are from the PDB. Uh, and so you can see that there's PDB codes. It's telling you, um, you know, information about where that's coming from. Uh, I can also go scroll down, and eventually I get to, um, you know, accession numbers that look like AA, blah 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 blah. That's going to be your your uh, your uh, sequence information. Um, so let's click on one of those. If I were to compare the sequences, which we'll see how to do on the last day of the class. Um, you'll see that they, they end up being very similar, as you would expect. Um, and then I can go look at source information. So this is a cDNA, and so that's telling me that's going to get me the, the complementary DNA sequence that's actually used. And so I could, you know, without having to go through the entire chromosome, I could find it. Um, and so you can see if you know the right ways to sort of refine your, your search, you can actually be very powerful. One way to refine your search is to go in here up to advanced search. And now you can go in and, and build. So for example, if you really want to look um, at you know, molecular weight or organism, you can filter by all of these things, right? So this is sort of the way to build up a search query. Uh, often, I don't really worry about that. Um, and I have some, some key ones memorized. And those are included here oh, that slide, uh, on the NCBI tricks uh, page. So this one is extremely useful uh, because it says, only search the most highly curated curated reference sequences, right? So if I add that to my query, and source DB refseq prop, I'm going to get even fewer results. All of the results have this accession number, number that starts with N, so NP for N protein, uh, NC for cDNA. Um, and again, these are going to be the, the most sort of uh, highly curated. If, if somebody says, hey, I'm talking about intestinal fat, fatty acid binding protein 2, um, this is going to be the sequence that they're talking about. And all other sequences or all other sequence variants are going to be defined relative to this reference sequence. That's why it's, it's called the reference sequence. So by putting reference sequence in there, 
and specifying an organism, you can dial down to very good um, sequence representations and find out what everybody's talking about when they talk about a particular protein sequence. The problem is that if, you, if you're studying something that's not super well studied, there might not be a reference sequence. Uh, and so in that case, if you don't get any hits, well then you gotta go, gotta take that out and look at some of the other ones and look at the literature. Um, if you're working in PubMed, so the journal database and your, your PI or your advisor says, well, I think they published a paper on intestinal fatty acid protein. You know, I think the author was uh, Montpelier, and it was sometime, you know, in 1998 to 2003. This will allow you to search for those types of, of qualifiers. You can also go into advanced search and, and build these up manually, but these are often ways to search that more quickly. Uh, and so, um, so for example, if you're searching 1998 to 2003, you use the colon to specify ranges. Uh, if you just want 1998, you just put 1998. Uh, and then you use the bracket DP. And then you can build onto this. So if you want to add like Ann Fitzky NC as the author, you can add that as an author list, right? And so I wasn't publishing papers uh, back in 1998. Um, but if I go back here into PubMed, now let's clear that out. So let's do Fitzky NC auth and 2002. Uh, we'll see. Uh, DP. Oh, no. Man. There we go. That was a young lad. Um, so, um, so you can search for papers based on the author and the year. And you can put in year ranges to find you know, papers between you know, 2004, 2007 using that colon feature. Again, this is how you can uh, you know, string uh, queries together. Remember, it always has to be capitals, so don't forget that. Uh, you can do things quite complex. You can use you know, um, parentheses to group things together if you want. Uh, these are in here as for examples. And then you can always go in and do advanced searches too. Right? And so if you're, if you're not sure, or if you're not like, oh, well, I forget which, which way to do that search, you can always build it up manually. It's just this takes a little bit more time if you don't have the numbers memorized. Okay, so we're, we're running out of time, so I'm not gonna do the practice, but presumably if you're working on a protein, you have a protein that you're interested in, right? You can find that information about that protein. This is the kind of stuff that you guys can do tonight or, or later on in the summer if you wanna give it a shot. Uh, the PDB is sort of the next big database that we're gonna talk about. Again, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on the PDB because there's an entire session based on, on the PDB, right? But, um, you know, we talked about the importance of structure and how structure is, is really related or, or the, the function is, is dependent on the tertiary structure of the protein. And so where do you get that information? You're a little early, but, but thank you. Um, where do you get that information? Well, you get it from the, the protein data bank. And the protein data bank is the database that stores all of the known protein structures that have been found so far. Uh, I just looked it up this morning with something like 141,000 protein structures uh, in the PDB. Uh, and as you might expect, there's you know it indexes by protein name, authors, who studied it, how they sort of determined the structure. Uh, lots of information here. And if I open this hyperlink and I search for, you know, intestinal, intestinal fatty acid binding protein, I guarantee you're going to find a whole bunch of results. And when you look at that result, you can then search. You can look for human, homo sapiens. You can refine it. 
And now you can look at the different structural properties. We'll use our PVB uh, session to talk about what some of these differences mean. You know, should I trust a structure that's 1.8 angstroms versus 2.1 angstroms? What else might I care about other than just straight up resolution? Um, but the same kind of things apply here. You can look at your search and you can see that, okay, well, there's, that's what I searched for. I can go in and refine the search and apply additional uh, qualifiers on it. Uh, so if I want to refine by resolution, that's where I would do that. We can go in, um, for example, one of the faculty members in our department uh, solved the structure of ricin, so the, the ricin toxin. Uh, and all PDBs, all PDB entries, have their own sort of unique identifiers. For the protein data bank, it's always four characters. In the case of, in the case of ricin, the identifier is 2AAI. And so if I go in here and search 2AAI, you might think, well, that's meaningless. But when I type that in, it brings up the structure entry for ricin. And you can see in here, there's our dead mills nut showing up right there. Um, and so you can see that, you know, there's this, the tertiary structure of the ricin toxin. Uh, now, you don't want to play with this too much, but... Uh, it's right there, and you can get all sorts of information about what, what this protein does. You get annotated parts of the sequence. Uh, if there's cofactors included in the PDB file, again, we'll look at more of this when we actually have our session on the PDB. But the point is that you can search for things, and if somebody tells you, hey, go look up the PDB entry for 2SNS, two, two which is one of the staphylococcal nuclease succession codes, you can go there and you, you know that you just put those four characters in and you know exactly what you're going to pre be presented with. Okay. So there's lots of different ways to solve structures of PDB files. Um, you can think about um, the experimental methodology, the main two ways that are done are x-rays and NMRs. Uh, lots of ways to assess the structure of a PDB file. Is it, is it a good structure? Is it a bad structure? Is it okay? Uh, again, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, we already showed you how you can identify organisms in the PDB. So if I'm searching here, I search for, again, just fatty acid binding protein. You can see that I'm bringing up the options here. I can search for different organisms. I can go and look at my refinement. And so here, example, I, for example, I, I refined um, the uh, R uh, resolution between 1 and 2 angstroms, uh, the working R factor, which, again, you guys don't know what that is yet, but um, you, know, you can specify that here. Uh, and so there's all sorts of ways to improve and drill down to the best structure that you need. Uh, and, it, and for the application, somebody's best structure might not be the same as somebody else's best structure. Okay, and so the final database that we're going to talk about here is called KEG. Uh, and this is sort of the biggest, sort of the high, highest up um, uh, database that, that we're going to talk about today. Uh, it's called the, the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes. Uh, it's extremely useful because it stores a lot of those kinds of figures that you might see in your biochemistry textbook, right? So we're gonna basically try to search intestinal fatty acid binding protein. Okay, so we search that tag, and again, a whole bunch of stuff comes up. We're going to get the, the very first one, because it looks to be the best match. And when we click on that, we have all sorts of information. So this gives us information about different accession numbers for this gene. 
So again, some of these will, will show up, you know, they'll take you back into um, the uh, NCBI databases. Um, some of them will take you to other databases that we're not going to talk about, like Swiss Pro or some of the, the European databases. Um, but what I want you to see here is if I search for um, fat digestion and absorption, which is a common topic brought up in most biochemistry, second semester biochemistry classes, it brings up a picture of an epithelial cell and it shows you, okay, if I have like a, a chylomicron or some kind of uh, my cell out here that contains fatty acids, how does that uh, get processed and metabolized? And so this shows you what those proteins are that are involved in that pathway. And so if you're thinking about, hey, what proteins might my, my protein of interest interact with, I can go in here and I can say, okay, look, um, intestinal fatty acid binding protein is right here. But the other proteins that, involve, that are involved in shuttling and, and transport of fatty acids are, you know, the CD36 number. And so I can click on that. Um, and so I can get information on that protein. I can scroll down. There's all sorts of other information here that I can find out uh, about my, my protein of interest. Um, similarly, if I'm interested in... Um, Let's do something else that you might have seen, phosphoglycerate kinase, another uh, traditional enzyme that's discussed in lots of biochemistry metabolism classes, right? So intestinal fatty acid protein, binding protein is kind of boring. It binds fatty acids in one place, lets them go in another place. Phosphoglycerate kinase actually has an enzymatic activity. So you can get information about the enzyme classification number, uh, which might have come up in one of your previous classes. Uh, but here again, you can click on the glycolysis uh, link, and you're immediately taken to the listing of glycolysis and how all those enzymes uh, tie together. Right? This is the reference pathway, but you can click up here and you'll be... I used to be able to click up. Is my browser? Yeah, my browser's kind of... Yeah, it's still loading. So you can click up there and get other specific organ organisms. And you can search for, you know, if, if, for example, you're really interested in E. coli metabolism or some bacterial organism, you can refine your search based on the particular type of organisms and see how the protein or how the pathways might differ from one organism to another organism to another organism. And again, all of these links here are clickable. So again, glucose 1-phosphate. Well, again, if you've taken biochemistry in the second semester, you'll start seeing a lot of familiar names uh, in these things. And even if you've just taken like biology or had high school metabolism, uh, a lot of these protein names are going to come up over and over again. And so there's some specifics. You know, again, a lot of the stuff that we've already looked at. Uh, there's phenylalanine hydrogelase, hydro hydroxylase. Uh, this is a protein involved in phytochelinuria, which is an inborn error of metabolism. It's a uh, disease that, that uh, lots of people have. They can't, um, you know, eat particular foods or, or take particular types of artificial sweeteners. Um, and so you can see this uh, enzyme is involved in uh, hydroxylation of phenylalanine, uh, breakdown of phenylalanine, conversion to something else. Uh, and so you can see the pathway that gets involved uh, there as well. Um, okay, we're right about at time, so I don't want to don't want to spend too much time for this. But I do want to hammer in a point here. And, and so it's a point that you guys will probably get if you had two minutes to discuss it, but we'll just rush through. These databases are extremely useful. There's, you know, we've, we've covered a fraction of what's out there, right? Um, but they're only go as good as the people who spend the time and curate them and put information in there, right? So 
I would be willing to trust the NCBI database, the KEG database, all the databases that we've talked about. But keep in mind that, that when, you, when you deal with you know, a system of information as large as the human genome, or as large as several organism, is organisms' genomes, there's bound to be mistakes every once in a while. So, so you know, take this as much as you can as good scientific truth. But if you find something that looks really fishy, you know, don't, don't invest, you know, you guys are undergraduates, graduate students, you're probably not going to be in a situation where, you know, your future career is based on, you know, something you find in these databases. On the other hand, if you're ever in a, in a position as a scientist someday, um, keep in mind that, that you might want to test some of the things uh, that you're finding in these databases. And particularly when you get to sort of new organisms that have recently had their genome sequenced, um, you know, annotation of those genomes might not be 100% accurate yet. And so if somebody says that there's not a gene there, or somebody says that there is a gene there, you might want to, well, okay, let's, let's do some experiments first to test. Um, because, you know, they're basically taking a big computer algorithm and predicting, oh, that's a gene, that's a gene, that's a gene. They might not have actually done the experiment, and they'll leave that up to you. And so having these advantages, having these large public databases is a huge advantage for, for scientific research. It makes life a lot simpler. Um, but you can't turn off your brain once you start surfing the internet. I mean, it's true in, in politics, it's true in Facebook, it's true for this too. Uh, and so just because it says it on the internet, um, always think about, okay, is this really, do I really believe this? And how would I test it if I wanted to find that out? Okay, so to quickly summarize this session, we talked a lot about protein properties. Um, from a practical point of view, understanding information about your protein and molecular properties of your protein are, are probably some of the most useful things that you could know going into a project where you're studying a protein. Um, and so if you, if you want to understand that, you've got to understand their structure, and you can use databases to, um, to get a lot of the information that you might want hands-on in the lab if you're starting to work with something new. Uh, questions? Yeah? How do you know if a public database is something efficient? So, so that's a great question, and I, I can't give you a great answer. Um, you know, a lot of it is experience. Um, so if you've worked with proteins for a long time, and if I'm looking at a protein and somebody says, this is a globular protein that has a particular function, and I know enough to compare it to another protein with the same function, and it looks entirely different, it has an entirely different charge profile, it has entirely different sequence composition, um, I might be willing to say, well, that seems, that I don't know that that's true. Um, and so having some of that biochemical practical experience under your belt is probably the best way to go there. Um, if you're ever about to invest you know, tens of thousands of dollars into something in a database, I think it's always a good idea to, to at least double check uh, before you make that kind of a large investment.